Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pre and Applied Mathematics Seminar. It's a pleasure for me to open session 78 of the seminar. Today we have two excellent speakers, Patrick Gerard and Jesus Ildefonso Diaz. Introducing uh, Patrick Gerard, we have to Professor Felipe Chavez. Thank you, Felipe, if you can start. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, everybody, for attending this uh, very nice afternoon of uh, good math. It's a pleasure for me to be here with these two great mathematicians. And the first speaker will be Professor Patrick Sheha. Patrick, Patrick is a well-known uh, specialist in partial differential equations. I believe everyone has come across in at some point on one of his works and uh, profound uh, work on the theory of PDEs. And uh, Patrick uh, is, uh, has written several articles, several uh, books, and uh, in particular, he has also an important uh, editorial service. He's uh, editor-in-chief of uh, Analysis and PDEs, the prestigious journal Analysis and PDEs, and uh, he's also in the committee, in the board of uh, many other journals. And uh, Patrick is a, has a prolific career that everybody knows, so I won't extend on that. And I just thank Patrick for uh, giving us this nice lecture on the, the zero dispersion limit for the Benjamin Ono equation on the line. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your invitation. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so it's a pleasure to, to talk to you this afternoon or for me this evening. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some very recent work about uh, uh, some um, well-known, I hope, uh, equation coming from fluid mechanics, which is called the Benjaminono equation. So let me remind you, uh, what is this Benjaminono equation on the line? So uh, this equation is, uh, is describing long internal gravity waves uh, where you have two fluids and uh, the, uh, the, the heavier fluid has infinite depth. So you, we are in the situation. So you should think of, for instance, uh, some, some, um, some water uh, below and some air above. And you here is strongly related to, uh, uh, to the deformation, so you, you, to, to the description of the inter interface between water and air. And this was uh, derived by Brooke Benjamin in a famous paper in Journal of Fluid Mechanics, uh, something like uh, more than 50 years ago, 56 years ago. There were also results in the same issues by, by Davis and Akrivos, who introduced essentially the same result. And then there was a, a, a nice result by um, the Japanese physicist Ono, uh, who studied in more detail the phenomena of uh, traveling waves. In fact, Benjamin already found some traveling waves. And, and the nice thing about this equation, which is of course an, an evolution equation, is that it has uh, explicit traveling waves, which are rational functions of X, okay? Uh, essentially, they are Poisson, Poisson kernels. Okay, so it's it's easy, and and then it was completely characterized by other people, uh, like uh, 30, 30 years later, uh, Amik and Tolan. Whatever. I'm I'm interested here in the evolution problem. So u is a function of t and x. It goes to zero at infinity, and there is just a, some some notation I would like to emphasize here absolute value of dx is what is just the Fourier multiplier. So I take Fourier transform on the line uh, with the usual uh, notation. And the Fourier multiplier, absolute value of dx or mod dx is just the multiplication by absolute value of xi, where xi is the Fourier variable. Okay. So, uh, if you prefer, it's also, uh, if you know a bit, a little bit uh, and like to work with the Hilbert transform, is the, the composition of the Hilbert transform with the standard derivative dx. So rigorous derivation of this model from 
The full Euler model of water waves was made by Bonnard, Lann, and So at the end of uh, 2000 years. And then there were, in fact, even before that, starting from the derivation, the formal derivation by Benjamin, there was a, a really, there were many contributions for, for the well-posedness of the in initial value problem. So you, initial value problem is of course the same thing as, as always, you, you pick a function u0 at t equals zero, u0 of x, and you want to know if there is exist a, a solution to this equation such that u at t equals zero is u zero, okay? So the first result was in fact due to my colleague Jean-Claude So, we, at that time, it was 1979, where he proved that essentially this equation is globally well posed if the if u is sufficiently regular in a Sobolev space, let's say H2. And then came many, many uh, contributions of different paper, different people, in particular Terry Tao in 2004 proved uh, that it was possible to, to prove global well posedness in H1. Then Ionescu Koenig proved in, L, in L2. There were also results by Ephraim and Tataru, more recent. And finally, very, very recently, Kilip, Lawrence and Vision it was in April of this year, they proved that it's possible to extend the flow map to uh, sublef spaces with negative regularity, which means that in that case, of course, the, 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 the function u squared does not make sense anymore, but the flow map still makes sense. And uh, of course, to, to do that, you use the lax pair structure and this lax pair structure will, will play some role in, in what I'm going to talk about. No, I'm not going to talk about initial value problem because now we know many things about that. It's a globally well-defined uh, evolution. My problem is about what I call the zero dispersion limit. So what is the zero dispersion limit? That's essentially the same equation, except that I put an epsilon in front of the dispersive operator here, dx mod dx. Okay, remember, here I had this equation. Now I put an epsilon in front of mod dx and I get, I, I, I put the Burgers term in the, uh, in the first uh, uh, left-hand side and I get this equation. And my problem is a problem of, uh, problem of an asymptotics. What happens as epsilon goes to zero? I have a nicely well-defined uh, solution, u epsilon. You can prove, for instance, that this uh, a conservation law for, for this evolution is the L2 norm. So you know that u epsilon at time t in L2 has the same L2 norm as u0, okay? So it's bounding in L2, so it's natural to, 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 ans to, to ask what is the, the limit, at least the weak limit of u epsilon, as epsilon goes to zero, okay? So this is my problem of zero dispersion limit. Zero dispersion because the dispersive part is precisely this operator, which makes uh, the, the solution global, okay? So now if I make epsilon go to zero, the effect of this operator becomes smaller and smaller and you might have no global solution I mean, global smooth solutions. And, uh, okay, so maybe we should start with T small enough. If T is small enough, you see, what is the equation you get? You get the Burgers or burgers hopf equation in its inviscid part. I think that everyone who worked on PDEs uh, uh, has, has crossed the, the way of this equation once in, its, in his career, DTU plus DX of U square equals zero. And if T is small enough, you can prove that this equation has a smooth solution. And then you can prove that U epsilon converge with no surprise to U, okay? But what happens for big T? So for big T, we know that this burgers hopf equation display singularities. The solution in general display some discontinuities, 
which are which are uh, responsible of what people call shock waves. So they are shock waves. So the question is, what happens to my weak limit u epsilon of t if it exists? What's the behavior of the solution u epsilon of this equation as epsilon goes to zero if t is big enough so that I'm after the time of shock waves, shock formations? Okay, is that clear? Don't hesitate to interrupt me if, if there is something wrong or not clear. I would be more than happy to 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 explain. Uh, I know it's not completely easy with uh, with these beamer st stuff, but I, I try to make it as as accessible as possible. Okay. So what is this limit? So my claim is that I'm going to answer this question in some wide generality on the datum. Okay. So I will have a very general datum, u0, for which I can describe the weak limit of u epsilon of t. So this problem is, in fact, not a new one. In, in fact, it started, the, this equation uh, started uh, with, uh, with uh, sorry, with Lax and Levermore exactly 50 years ago, but it was for another equation which is well known also in fluid mechanics, which is the Kortevec de Vries equation. So the Kortevec de Vries equation, I've not written here because I'm not going to talk about it, but essentially that's the same equation, except that you replace mod dx here by dx square, so that you have dx, dx square, and dx cube here. So that's the same problem. It turns out that this Kortevec de Vries equation has a very important structure, which was discovered by Gardner, Gre uh, Gardner Green, uh, Kruskal, and Mura in 1967, the same year as uh, Benjamin introduced this equation. Uh, and this structure is called integrable structure. Okay, Integrable is not so clear to define for infinite dimensional uh, evolution equations, but it turns out that there are ways <coughs> of studying these equations using what is called a tool which is called inverse scattering theory. But it necessitates quite stringent assumptions on the datum u0. Okay. So that's what they did in 1983. In fact, it was the PhD thesis of, of Dave Levermore. Uh, and then many other authors uh, improved their results. Uh, describing u epsilon as, as epsilon goes to zero, but the, the, the results are rather complicated and they are made in terms of uh, some spectral theory related to an operator, which is called the Lax operator for the Kartavik de Vries equation, which is a Schrodinger operator of potential u. I'm not going to go that far, but what I would like to tell you is about the, the numerical approaches which were made both for Kortevec de Vries by Grava, Tamara Grava and Christian Klein, starting from a paper in, uh, in communication in pure and applied math in 2007. And, and some, some people also, this, this guy was in fact a master student in NTNU. NTNU is a is Norwegian uh, university in Trondheim under the, under the direction of Elge Holden. And he studied uh, exactly the problem I'm studying here, this, but only numerically. So he made numerical simulation of this equation. And the point is that for this numerical simulation, display very, very strong oscillations of u epsilon. They are extremely strong oscillations. So uh, you can you can find his, his master uh, it, it's his master uh, thesis. It's it's accessible on the on the web. So uh, if you look for fixed uh, um Benjamin or no and numerics, you will find that or zero dispersion numerics. I don't remember, but that's it, it, you you will find nice uh, nice pictures. I don't reproduce them here. But then there were some results for special data, like typically, for instance, one over one plus x square, so bell-shaped data by Peter Miller and his collaborators, and they found some special uh, solution, some special formula, for instance, for for, for the weak limit u epsilon, and more recently, my my 
former student Louise Gasso, uh, the, the last years, studied the periodic case and she found also partial results using, uh, I, I have not talked about the periodic case because I don't want to mix everything, but she used uh, some inverse spectral theory that I developed by uh, with my collaborators, uh, um, Top, Thomas Kapler and Peter Topalov. Whatever. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to revisit completely the problem for this benjamin Ono equation, and I'm going to use a completely different approach from the one which was used by these authors. And in particular, I'm going to bypass this inverse scattering theory that you might know or not know. But if you don't know, it's not a problem because I'm not going to use it. Uh, so uh, what's the result? OK, before, before going to the result, of course, I should remember, uh, remind you that uh, when you solve the, the Berger's equation, the inverse Berger's equation, let me come back to this equation here, dTU plus dx of u squared equals zero, there is a way of solving it, at least for smooth uh, solutions, using the method of characteristics. And the characteristic, the characteristic of, uh, of a point, um, starting at, at t equals zero at the point at the position y looks like this it's y plus 2t u zero of y here i plotted three uh three lines three three curves like y plus 2t u zero of y for different value of t okay so i pick a u zero which is typically for instance a bell shaped a bell shaped uh function like uh, two over one plus y square and i look at that so and so first you you have something like this, and then you, you have a, some some bump here. So that if you pick an x here, and you ask what is the number of solution of of y plus two t u zero of y equals x. So for t small, there is just one y for each x, but then if t is bigger, you will have different solutions, like typically y zero, y one, y two, and as a consequence. If you look at the plane of t and x, you will have this is about my 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 the behavior of my function u epsilon of tx. Inside this this domain, there will be very big oscillations of u epsilon of t and x. Outside of this domain, essentially everything will be fine, and you will get one solution, smooth solution of burgers. But here you will start, you will have very strong oscillations, and it seems very difficult to describe the weak limit we are looking for. So now it's time for me to state the main result of, of this talk. So this is a result I proved uh, this year in, uh, in July, and it's already on, on the archive. Uh, so I'm given a function u0, which is in L2, real valued, and also I assume that it's bounded, it's important to assume that it's bounded. And for every t, I consider the solution of the benjamin Ono equation with weak dispersion. And I claim that for every t, u epsilon of t as a bounded function of L2 is weakly convergent in L2 to some function that I denote by zd, like zero dispersion of u0 at time t. And this function is completely characterized by this equation. I compute its derivative in x. And its derivative in x is the quotient by one by, uh, in the denominator 2t. So I assume, for instance, that t is different from 0. Otherwise, of course, zd of u0 of 0 is u0. It's not, uh, not mysterious. But for t different from 0, I have the quotient by 2t of what? of this guy, which is one minus a measure. And this measure, a positive measure, is given by this formula. For any test function phi, the integral of phi, again, a measure d mu f, here f is 2t u0, So, you, but you can define it for any L infinity function f, is the integral of phi of y plus f of y dy okay so it's a somewhat uh, maybe somewhat mysterious formula but that's the most general you can have 
in in the next slide, I will give you a more uh, a more familiar formula if you are interested in the connection to uh, the burgers and the inviscid burgers equation and the problem of characteristics. But here I, I want to, to write it down. And moreover, I would like that this object satisfies the maximum principle. The maximum principle means that the, the soup of ZD of U0 of T as X uh, uh, display describes R is bounded by the essential soup of U0. And the same for the infimum. So the bounds of this zero dispersion limit are, are in sandwich between the bounds of U0. This is extremely surprising. Why? Because the, such maximum principle is completely wrong for a given value of epsilon. This equation is a dispersive equation, like a Schrodinger equation. Or, and for, for, for such an equation, you don't expect to have any kind of maximum principle. In fact, you, you don't expect to get to, 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 to have an L infinity bound for, for the solution itself. And certainly not this one. So in some sense, as epsilon goes to zero, you recover some kind of maximum principle. And moreover, you can really compute the derivative of your weak limit. So you can compute the weak limit fact. Okay. Just by integrating this. Remember, uh, observe one thing which is quite interesting. This mu is a positive measure. Okay. Uh, so this means that this ZD of U0 has a derivative, which is a measure. This means that this ZD of U0 at time t is in fact in the locally bounded variation function. While of course my U0 is not bounded variation, it's just in L2 and in L infinity. But this guy is in fact bounded variation. So there is some kind of smoothing effect as t tends to t different from zero, this guy is slightly more smooth than u zero itself. Okay. And now I'm going to, to give you the connection to the inverse Burgers equation. So this is the second part of my theorem. I assume now that u zero is a C1 function. Moreover, it tends to zero at infinity and also assume that it's L2, but it's moreover a C1 function. And then I look at my characteristics. Remember these characteristics, y plus 2t, u0 of y. So essentially, I pick an x, which is generic outside of uh, some uh, compact subset of measure 0, which corresponds to the critical values of this function, c1 function, which is of measure 0 because of South's theorem. And uh, I claim that there exists a non-negative number integer L such that for such X, the equation has two L plus one simple real solutions that I denote by Y zero, Y one, Y two L. And they are of course function of T and X, okay? So this is just implicit function theorem if you like or something like this. And then I claim that the zero dispersion limit is given by a formula which is extremely simple. I look at the values of u0 at all these functions. This is the value which is propagated along the characteristics of the Burgers equation. So if you if you want these u0 of y1, y0, y1, etc., they are uh, mul multiple valued, multiple values of, of the Burgers solution, but the burger solution is, is not single valued because, because of the crossing of characteristics. And the zero dispersion limit is given by taking the uh, alternate sum of all these values. So you take, you look at all the values uh, of u0 along the characteristics which arrive at t and x at the point where I'm interested in, and I take the alternate sum of all the values, and this is the zero dispersion limit. Now, I don't know if they are uh, experts of uh, uh, hyperbolic conservation laws in the audience, but if they are, they might have recognized some, so this is the, the picture for crossing of characteristics, but they might have recognized some famous scheme 
introduced by Jan Brenier in the 80s, which is which he called the transport collapse scheme. So this is the same formula that he called capital T of T acting on U0 of X. So it's a nonlinear family of operator, capital T of T acting on function U0, say in L infinity. And he proved in a very nice paper, in fact, series of papers, that this formula approximates the entropic solution of the inverse Burgers of equation through a trotter cato formula. What does that mean? It takes, you start from the initial value u0. You look at this capital T of t, but you divide t by n, and you make an iteration, n iteration of capital T of t over n. And now you make n go to infinity. And what Brenier proved in 1981 is that the guy here converged to the entropic solution, the Khrushchev solution, if you prefer, of the inviscid burgers of equation. And it's somewhat surprising. I don't have a, an explanation except by, by calculation that the same formula gives our dis zero dispersion limit for the benjamin Ono equation. Okay. So what's the strategy for proving this? Uh, first, we shall... Uh, in fact, we shall use an explicit formula for the solution of the benjamin Ono equation with arbitrary datum in L2 intersection L and infinity. And this will completely bypass inverse spectral theory, but this will use the some kind of integrability, which is related to a lax pair structure, which was discovered soon after, uh, uh, rather, yes, uh, after, after the introduction by Benjamin and Ono. Then we will pass to the dis zero dispersion limit, and we will have a first explicit formula. But we will you will see it's a little bit complicated. And then I will make the link with the multi-valued solution of the inverse Burgers equation from the method of characteristics I discussed. And I, I will in a special case. And the special case will be u zero not only c one but u zero a rational datum, so a rational function. Okay, but any rational function. And finally, there is an approximation argument. I will probably not have time for, for discussing this. I, I, I'd just like to, to show you the main steps of the proof. So for the first step, I need to introduce a little bit of functional analysis and of complex analysis. I have to introduce what is called the Hardy space on the line. So the RD space of the line, I will call it L2 plus of R, is the, the set, the space of function in L2, such that the Fourier transform is zero for C negative. So the Fourier transform of this function is supported by the positive half line, C non-negative. There is a famous result, which is called the palais wiener theorem, uh, which tells you that this is the same space, uh, the space of holomorphic function in the upper half plane. C plus is the upper half plane, imaginary of Z positive, such that the supremum of the L2 norm of F on the unreasonable line um, is always uh, finite, okay? And the supremum is in fact the L2 norm square of F on the line. Okay, so this is a classical, uh, Harmonic analysis, you can find, for instance, them in, in the, the standard book by, by Walter Rudin or many others. And then since this RD space is a closed subspace of L2, there is a orthogonal projector, which is called the ries zege orthogonal projector, which just corresponds to take your function F in L2, take its Fourier transform and multiply by the characteristic function of the half line. Just cut off the Fourier transform and keep the half the, the value on the half line and make it zero on the other half line. Okay. And then you, you can define nice operators on, on this RD space, given a, an L infinity function on the line, you can define an operator which is called the tuplets operator, which sends F to BF projected because BF 
if B is just a function in L infinity, BF has no reason to be in L2 plus. So you project BF and you get, uh, of course, a guy in L2 plus. So it's some kind of uh, smoothed product by B. This operator is bounded and you can prove that it's adjoint is exactly the, uh, the tuplets operator corresponding to the conjugate function B bar. Now you introduce for any function U in L infinity, you introduce an operator, which is a, an operator for H1, H1 intersection L2 plus. So you look at the, the Sobolev functions on the line, which are also in the RD space and sending this into L2 plus, and you look at this operator. It's just a first order differential operator, but there is another term here, which is precisely the tuplets operator associated to you. You can prove that this is in fact an unbounded self-adjoint operator with this domain on L2 plus, and you can also define a bounded anti-self-adjoint operator. Maybe you should not pay too much attention to this, uh, but it exists and it's anti-self-adjoint in send L2 plus to L2 plus, H1 plus into H1 plus. And the main point here is this theorem, which was in fact found by Nakamura, Fokasablovitz and other people uh, under different formulation. I, I give you the formulation that uh, we use with Thomas Kapler. If U is a smooth function, I mean, sufficiently smooth, a, for instance, in H2, solving the benjamin Nono equation, then the evolution of this operator LU is given by the commutator of BU with LU. And this as a consequence, it tells you that if I introduce some special family of unitary operator, which solve an ODE, a linear ODE on the space of bounded operators on L2 plus, I get that this operator LU at time T, if U is solution of the benjamin Nono equation, is unitarily equivalent to LU at time zero. Okay, so this is just to show you <coughs> how it looks like. I, I, I'm not going to give any proof of that. I, I'm just showing you the, the main steps. And then I come to the explicit formula of uh, for, for the solution of benjamin Nono equation. So I look at the what is called the lax berling semigroup on the Hardy space. It just corresponds to multiplying by e to the i eta x for et every eta non-negative. The infinitesimal generator of this semigroup is just the multiplication by x, but since it's on L2+, plus, this is not self-adjoint operator, and it has a, a, an adjoint, it has an adjoint uh, which is which I denote by G, like generator, which is of course the generator of the star, the adjoint of S of eta. And this is not very complicated to understand. It's just an operator in the Fourier representation, which corresponds to I D D C of, of the Fourier transform on the domain of function F in L2 plus, whose restriction to zero infinity are in the Sobolev space. Okay, so that's some kind of uh, smooth uh, version of multiplication by X. And then I introduce another notation, which is just, if you have a function F hat, uh, which has, uh, which is saying in, in the, well, uh, in, in the Sobolev space on zero one, I, I consider the, uh, just the right limit of F at, at T equals, Z, of X equals zero plus. And I call it I plus of F. So that's some kind of, it's not an integral because, because F is not in L1, but it's some kind of, again, some kind of rigorized integral. And now the theorem that I proved last year is that if I have uh, any solution smooth enough of the benjamin Nono equation, I can describe it by its projection. So you take its projection on the RD space, PU of TX, I can write because u is real valued u as pu plus pu bar. This is not mysterious. This is very simple. And now to, to describe pu, I just need to call it to, to know its value in the upper half plane as a holomorphic function. 
And I have an explicit formula for this PU. This explicit formula is, of course, related to PU at t equals zero, and it's related to this operator LU zero. So here you have a resolvent operator acting on PU zero, and you get that, and then I plus. Now, what's doing? what do you do? Okay, you just rescale everything. If you rescale t into epsilon t and u in u divided by epsilon, you get, in fact, the, uh, the benjamin Nono equation for u epsilon. And you get, again, pu epsilon. Uh, sorry, it's a typo. Here, it should be a z. Pu epsilon of t and z is 1 over 2 i pi, the same thing. But here, you change t into epsilon t u0 into u0 of epsilon, and you get finally this expression. And now it's it's easy to, 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 to guess what's going on. As epsilon goes to zero, you can prove, in fact, that this expression corresponds to the same, you see, using the L2 conservation law, using this, you get indeed, indeed that u epsilon goes weakly to zero, to, to this expression. And this is my expression of zd of u0 of tz, Again, it's a slightly complicated expression in terms of RD space, but at least we know that a weak limit exists. It's important because, you know, you, you just had a family of functions which, are, which were bounded in L2. You know that there is a weak limit up to extraction of, of a subsequence. Here I can tell you there is no necessity of extracting any subsequence. You have a weak limit for all time, and it's given by this strange formula, but at least it exists. And it's in fact a remark that this right hand side is continuous with respect to U0 for the strong topology of L2. As soon as I have an a priori bound on U0 in L infinity, it's not very difficult. Now, doing that, I'm going to tell you in just uh, one slide how to, to, to deal with rational data. So I assume now that u0 is a rational function and q0 is a monic polynomial of degree 2n. Well, because of course u0 is well defined on the line, so its, it's denominator should not have any zero on the line. So it means that it has to be a polynomial of degree uh, of even degree with no zero on the line. And p0 is a real polynomial of degree, uh, well, 2n minus one at most. Then if you look at the characteristics equation here, it's a polynomial equation of degree even, uh, odds of degree 2n plus 1. And you can look at uh, the real solutions that I denote by y0, y2l. That's exactly my y0, y2l. And now you can play with these expressions. And you can see that in that case, these expressions are in fact analytic function of x. So you can look at what happens is x, if x becomes, uh, becomes a z in the upper half plane. And then you can, in fact, solve the resolvent equation here for, of this ftz. And you can prove that this resolvent equation has a rational solution. And it can be explicitly calculated through an, a linear system of size n plus 1. So, of course, this is... A uh, little technical, I don't want to go further, but essentially the point is that in the case of a rational datum, this equation, this equation is easy uh, to, to, to solve. This resolvent equation is easy to solve. And the expression, well, I explained this, but I, I don't have time to, to go so, so much. This, this is the way you, you get the Brunier expression for our weak limit, okay? And then once you have this, well, again, by making a little of calculations, but this is not the most difficult part, uh, then you get the maximum principle and the weak formula. What about why the maximum principle is extremely simple? Because <clears throat> remember that the way k is a sequence of, of uh, uh, is, a, is a monotonic sequence of real numbers. And, and, and u0 of y satisfy y plus 2t u0 of y equal x, the same x. So this means that the u0 of yk is monically, monoton monotonically sorry, decreasing. So you have an alternate sum of a monotonic sequence. 
So you get, of course, by a standard argument, a uh, maximum principle. And the weak formula is a little more, more delicate. Uh, you can look at uh, my, my paper on the archive for this, but this is not the main point. The main point is that really making the connection between the formula and the RD space and this formula, which is here. Okay, this is my last slide. So, of course, the perspectives are, the main perspective is now not only to describe the weak limit, but to describe the whole oscillations of U epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, I told you there are many oscillations, but we would like to see them and what are the profiles of oscillation. And this is work in progress in collaboration with Elliot Blackstone, Louis Gasso, my former student, who is now in CNRS uh, in France, and Peter Miller, uh, who is professor in Michigan University that you probably know. And um, the second perspective is a much more open question. Can one prove such a general result for the zero dispersion limit of quarter vec degrees? I don't know. I don't know because I don't have a similar explicit formula for quarter vec degrees. And of course, you could more ask, ask the question for a more general nonlinear dispersive equation, which is a, a, a perturbation of Burgers. And of course, I don't know either. So it's a widely open problem, even for Cortevec de Vries. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Uh, now we will open the mic and the chat for anyone who wants to ask any question. Any question, if anyone has, can use directly the chat or that I can make the question or you can use the... the Don't the be microphone. afraid to ask, uh, yes. Oh, I see something in the chat here. Yeah, um, no, it was one. No, oh, this one is uh, is open, yeah. Yeah, I okay. actually, my question was actually for the KDV equation, so... Yeah, uh, please. Yeah, it's exactly. so th this would be more difficult because it's easy to say, no? we don't have the exact we solution. We don't have the explicit formula. We have, in fact, formula using the inverse scattering theory that you yeah. will find, for instance, in in, uh, in Lax Levermore job. But but uh, they are much more delicate, and they are they they assume much more stringent assumptions on the data. Mm. U zero, okay, yeah. because you need to do some scattering theory for for the Schrödinger operator minus dx squared plus u zero. So, for instance, u zero should be in L one which is not at all the case here. You don't need new zero to be integrable, but you need many more assumptions. And that's not the only thing. The point is that the formula at the end is really uh, much more uh, delicate to interpret in terms of the characteristics of the Burgers equation, because we have the same Burgers equation formally at, at, as epsilon goes, goes to zero. But for the moment, Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I'm not aware of any paper making the connection between lax Levermore formula and the inviscid Burgers equation. So it's, it's really much more delicate for, for KDV, and it's a widely open problem, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's curious because, for instance, uh, Patrick, if you, of course, you could uh, directly do, for instance, for instance, if you take the, the, the the heat equation conversion to the burgers because then you know yes. many things, and then you compare the two things uh, yes. because at the end you are going to the it's same. Completely equation. different. The heat equation converging to burgers gives you the Khrushchev yeah, solution exactly. or the entropic solution. For this, we know exactly we have a lax oleinic formula, which is of course completely different from this one. Yeah, and and the solution is different. Uh, the, you you will see in my in my paper I I I made the computation the explicit computation for u zero to be the characteristic function of an interval. Say okay, so for this you can compute the Khrushchev equation very easily. It's a classical formula. You will have a shock waves, and and a refraction wave. For me, I don't see any kind of shock wave. The solution <laughs> for t different from zero is in fact always continuous. Yeah, it's curious. So it's quite curious, yes. Yeah, it's curious indeed. indeed. It's a phenomenon that we, we still have to understand, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, there are many things, as you said, it's, it's good. 
so uh, does anybody has a question comments so no no I, it, so patrick just uh, it is a small actually curiosity so imagine that you take the initial data yeah which is which is uh, good enough that you can approximate the Burgers equation both for the heat and your uh, and your uh, yeah. Mi uno. So yeah. what you are saying is that somehow at the limit you are getting some two different type of solutions. Yes, except yeah. except for small time. For small time, yeah. the the solution is smooth. So this is a smooth solution of Burgers in both and cases. And at some point they they. But they at some to... point, yes, they they will diverge completely. Okay. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. While they both satisfy the maximum principle at the limit. Yeah. And this is still, for instance, typically for KDV, I don't know if the, the solution by lax eleve or more satisfies the maximum principle. Frankly, I don't know. But for both for Khrushchev and for my my for my solution for, for Benjamin Nono, it does. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, so, it's indeed very, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, questions, comments? Uh, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Patrick for this very, very nice talk and uh, thank you. a lot of open, open questions to be studied in the future. So, thank you very much, Patrick, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you again in our seminar. I hope so. Thank you <laughs> very much. Thank you, Felipe. I thank you a lot, Professor Patrick Gerald, for your amazing talk. Thank you.